What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another Top Figure podcast. Today we have a special guest, and uh, we're just gonna dig deep here today. Talk about e-commerce. As you guys know, the last episode we brought Beatrice on. She literally talked about how she scaled and how she got into Target and how brand her brand is growing. Um, today we have another All Star on the podcast. Um, I want to give a round of applause to Justin Phillips. He's a serial entrepreneur, co-founder of Support Black College. Glad to have you on the show, brother. Welcome. Welcome. Man, I appreciate y'all for having me. I appreciate it. Perfect, perfect. All right, so let's get right into it, right? So support Black College, like that brand, like, you know, I, it's on 2K now. It's everywhere. Uh, you guys worked with um, the All-Stars. You guys are working, like I've seen celebrities like Chris Paul wearing it, uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo, all these NBA players. Like, first, let's start there. How did you guys establish the rela- this close relationship with the NBA, you know, as they don't work with just anybody? You know, it's super hard to work with them. It's super hard to get tapped in. Let's start there, and then we'll go into the story of how you guys got started and everything. Yeah, sure. So the NBA, it's crazy because, like, I want to say it was really easy, but it was just, like, um, finding a way in. We found a way in with Chris Paul because Chris Paul was wearing a bunch of HBCU stuff already but wasn't wearing any of our stuff. And then we were like, all right, we got to figure out how to get this guy some of our stuff. So we had some failures. Uh, Corey actually went to a game when they were here playing. We are in Atlanta, so they were playing the Hawks. And Corey went up to the game, didn't know how he was going to – get in contact with anyone, just bought a ticket regularly. And then when Chris Paul was walking through the um, the tunnel, he went over to the side and was trying to like get his attention, but didn't work. And then, you know, that was a failure. So we just chopped it up. But we've done that before where we've go- gone into random places and then been able to get in contact with these celebrities and influencers, but it just didn't work that time. So he came back and we were like, bro, we got to figure out how to get in touch with them. So we realized that if we can get in touch with all of these people's stylists, then we can actually get all of them to wear our stuff because we were like, OK, these people, most of them aren't dressing themselves, you know, like the LeBrons and all these big players, they got so much to worry about. They're paying people just to think what outfits to put on for them. So I'm like, okay, let's figure out, you know, any stylist that we can get in touch with. So we did a lot of research, found out uh, who Chris Paul's stylist was, and we contacted her via DM. And she was like, well, we already ordered some stuff, but it just hasn't got sent out yet. And I'm like, oh, shit, like, we need to go <laughs> figure out what, what order it was. So we, we found our order, and then we shipped them out a bunch of stuff inside of the order. And then like a day or two later, he had wore some stuff and I was like, OK, cool. Like the stylist is the way to go to get inside of all of these different uh, players, you know, just their role, like their Rolodex of clothing or whatever. So contacted a bunch of different other stylists. And then that's how we started to get more and more players, because a lot of them all have the same stylist. So uh, Devin Booker and, you know, who else? Um Jason Tatum, like all of them have the same stylist. So if you can just get in contact with one of them, then you're straight. So we kind of leveraged the Chris Paul relationship and said, hey, Chris Paul's wearing our stuff. Like, what's good with y'all? Like, you know, we need to get everybody going because this is a good cause. So Chris Paul's obviously the um, the head of the, the president of the Player Association as well. So it actually turned out that we were supposed to do something for the Players Association because when we got that relationship with Chris Paul, we really nurtured it. They wanted to do some stuff on social media, some stuff with their, um, with their like, their, his team in general and with their nonprofit. So we were just trying to help out in any way that we could. Anything that they asked for, we would like instantly get it done. And we started to become like, for lack of a better term, like part of their team. And they were asking us for a bunch of different stuff. And we just like filling the need, not knowing like how it would return for us. And then it ended up being, hey, we want you guys to make something for the NBA Players Association. And that actually ended up falling through. But the Players Association called us back and was like, yo, you can't do this for the Players Association right now because the time is kind of messed up. But let me get you in contact with the actual NBA because I know that they're trying to do something for Hold on, someone's FaceTime me. Clients. So let me do let me get you linked in with the actual NBA because they're trying to do something for the All Star game. It might work out. Who knows? Let me just put y'all in contact. So they put us in contact and then that turned into us making all of the stuff for the All Star game, obviously going, getting invited to the All Star game and doing interviews and like all of that stuff, too. So that was kind of how the whole thing came together. That's awesome. That's 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 dope. That's a great story of like, you know, 
persistence. Uh, y'all were just finding different ways, avenues, all that. That was that was impressive. Mm -hmm. That's dope. That's dope. So now this gives you guys a background of what support college is and the great things they're doing. So how did it all start? Let's go there. Like, how did the brand start? Like, how did you guys come up with the idea? You know, HBCU yeah. is like now starting to become common as Master P's son just committed to a HBCU yeah. school. You know, so yeah, that's legendary. He's they're also they're in Minnesota playing here in Minnesota too. So that that yeah. that was dope too. So like now the spot spotlight is on HBCU. A lot of people are committing there. A lot of people are going there. So it's become more normalized, right? And you guys probably have a big part to do with it also, right? So like, how did this all come about this idea? And uh, let's get into that story. Yeah, so we were in college. Um, 20. I graduated high school in 2011. So when we went into college, me and Corey were really just friends. And Corey had the idea to kind of make some stuff because his it was actually I was never a part of the business until 2018. So we'll we'll get there in a minute. But in the beginning, Corey and his cousin, you know, his cousin was a really good is a good designer. And Corey was at HBCU a year before I was. So I was a freshman when I came in and he was a sophomore when we had first met. But he had an idea of like, yo, like, HBCU has really kind of changed my life since I came here and like taught me more about myself and put me around a bunch of different black people that look like me and are interested in the same things. Why aren't people, you know, really aware of this and what's going on? And then when I came in as a freshman, we started to become friends through throwing parties together. And I was just trying to help out. You know, I was like, here, I'll be in y'all's first photo shoot. I'll make you guys your first Instagram and Twitter, get you guys a couple hundred followers because my background was in digital marketing because that was what I wanted to do. So, you know, they started to do their own thing for a few years and they had what we were doing was in, in the beginning was we had state clubs at like our HBCU. So, you know, like Texas Club, North Carolina Club, whatever. Corey was the president of North Carolina Club and I was the on the e-board for like promotions of the Texas Club. So they made a bunch of stuff for the North Carolina club. And then I got them to make a bunch of stuff for the Texas club. And then everybody was like, well, that's cool. But like, we want something for Howard University. We want something for North Carolina A&T. We want like our own stuff. So then we're like, all right, cool. Like, let's just start making stuff for all of the schools. And then everybody started to like it. So I end up graduating. Corey ends up graduating. He goes and works for Sean Parker, one of the creators of Facebook on a new startup project. And I go back home and get a job. And then a few a few years go by, bro. And he's like, yo, like come down to Atlanta. Let's take this seriously and let's like try to explode it. And then I ended up not going the first time he asked me. And then a few months went by and then I was like, you know what, let me go back out there and like, you know, just I don't got nothing to lose. Like I, I've got a job. So I quit. I quit my job and then I just moved to Atlanta. And then that's when we started to take it real seriously. But in the beginning, it was really just like, you know, two kids, single mother household, you know, went to Howard and saw that it changed who we were and it, it brought us around a bunch of people that look like us that had the same motives and you know goals and then we're like more people need to know about this because the only reason that i even went to howard in general is because i was getting a haircut and then my barber was like yo what schools did you get accepted to and i told him like baylor university of north texas and howard he's like bro go to howard and i was like all right and i just went so like i had no clue so we were like bro we got to get this out to more kids because there's no reason that my mom my grandma like his people like no one knew what it was that's dope man and you had like this vision of really just like um and i want to get into really just your story of you know especially with entrepreneurship we all know how risky it is right it's very uh it's an unknown it's an unknown territory and you know we have a story of you know when we first started off we signed our office lease and we had only two months of rent saved up and we signed we locked ourselves into like a year-long commitment and it's like that's the type of risk it takes to get into entrepreneurship you have a pretty cool story of like really like you had two cents in your account and you went all in you went all in you know and you shared that uh you know i saw that on your social media and that was really dope talk about walk the, walk us through what was going on in your mind when you did that to really invest and go all in to support black colleges and like what was what was that belief pattern yeah, um, I think it was because, like I said, Corey had invited me to come down to Atlanta before. And when I initially went and left school or graduated from school and came back down, I was like, all right, I need to find a job. I was like, I was like hella depressed back then, bro. I had like, I was super popular. Like me and Corey were, I was 
just killing it in school, like super popular, throwing all the parties, but I didn't have like a job offer. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a place to stay. I had none of the things that you would think that a college graduate would want. So I was like, you know what? Let me just get a job, move back down with my mom in Houston and just start to stack some money up. But I quickly realized that, you know, especially in a black household, like when you live in a house, you under their rules. So I was like, okay, let me go ahead and get up out of here. So it took me like a month to just get me a job and just go do my own thing. Mm-hmm. So I get a job and I start stacking some money up. But then I realized also very quickly that one, I'm a terrible employee. And that two, that um, I just don't like people telling me what to do and where I can be and what I can and can't do and stuff. So I ended up quitting, but I had some money saved up. I had like maybe like 20 something thousand saved up because I was living in a one bedroom apartment with five people. So we were splitting the rent, you know, $700 between five people is like a hundred something dollars. So we was, I was just stacking up stupid bread. So I ended up um, getting into a bunch of like just negative activity, bro. Like just illegal stuff, you know, just once I left my job because I needed to just constantly get money. So Corey was calling me right at the beginning of all of that. He's like, yo, come down and come move. And I'm like, nah, like I'm, I'm having money, bro. Like I'm doing my thing. Like it is what it is. And then, so then something happened and it was just like, yo, bro, you either, I'm telling myself, I'm like, all right, bro, you either gonna like stop being one foot in, one foot out and like really get it in and get active. Or you just like go and do the right thing, but it's unknown because you don't know if this is going to work out yet, but you have the skills and what it takes to make it happen. And I knew what support that colleges could be in my head, but I just had to make that decision. So I ended up leaving the negative stuff behind and just going to move out there with Corey with the money that I had. So I had like maybe like 20 something thousand. I, at that point, I was really like believing in cryptocurrency and I just put half of it straight into crypto, just off rip that like, I just believed in it. That was like around 2016, 2017. And then the other half, I had like 10,000 left. So I told myself I wasn't going to touch the crypto portfolio. So I got $10,000 and two cents left. And Corey was like, yo, bro, I got $20,000 in inventory. You can just send me 10 bands and then we're going to be 50-50 partners. Handshake deal is what it is. Granted, he didn't know, you know that I only had that amount of money left. He just was asking me for what he wanted. Mm-hmm. So sent that over to him and I was immediately broke, you know. I didn't know how I was gonna eat. I didn't know how I was gonna pay rent. I couldn't tell him I ain't nigga. I ain't got no rent. Like you know, I couldn't tell him I didn't have rent. And then also my apartment back home in Houston was being subleased. So I left to like get out of the negative environment. So I subleased my apartment. And then the first month they didn't pay. So I had two rents and no food and Damn. no money either. So I'm like, all right, we, we gotta figure something out. But when in my head what was going through it was like. You know, you've been broke before. You just left a situation that was negative. You slept on the floor before. You've been in a house with four or five people at once before. Either it works out and you make you some money and it does well, or it doesn't. You just go back to where you was at and then you just try to hustle and get it right again. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it was it was really that. So I was comfortable with going back to where I was and I knew that I had what it took to make it happen. So I was like, all right, either it's going to happen or I'll just be back where I was a month ago. Who cares? So that was what I was thinking, bro. Like in your head, you already knew you was going to come back up. Like you've made money before, you know. And it's just that that's really what it is. Just having that belief of just like, I know it's going to work. Like if ends or buts about it, like I know I'm going to get it because if you don't have that firm belief, it's never really going to work out. Yeah. And it's funny because back then I only thought that the brand can make like a hundred thousand dollars in a month. I was like, when he asked me, could like, would I want to come down and do it? I was like, yeah, bro. Like I do want to do it. I think we could probably get like a hundred thousand a month, bro. Like that's probably the best we can do. Like, but that's a lot. Like, so let's try. And you know, my mindset was stuck. Like a hundred thousand a month is possible. Like we can do that. And then that's when I just left and we did it. But you know, this is funny. Like, cause back then, like that was the ceiling, you know? So now it's now it just gets raised you know yep, yep that's 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 super now that's super dope so talk about like so you moved so you moved to atlanta right and when you moved to atlanta you just went straight into working at support black college or were you you also had a, like a side hustle job somewhere or 
So I had a I had a side hustle because that's why I quit my job. I had a social media management business and I was making like a hundred dollars per client. So I had like six hundred, seven hundred dollars coming in off of that while I was still at my job. So I was like, all right, my rent's a hundred something, two hundred, and to eat, I'm good. Like as long as I can pay, you know, that money, I was straight. So I quit and then I moved down. So then when I moved down, I'm like, well, rent down here is like eight something, like an eight, nine. So I got to like get my money up. So um, I was still doing that side business because I didn't get involved in support black colleges until a month after I moved down to Atlanta. So I, um, I, I was just hustling the side business. And literally like the first 30 days when I came down, I just like went in my room close the door and like just straight locked in on building clients so like for 30 days you could really ask Corey like sitting in front of my computer on my phone probably like 14 to 16 hours a day just trying to get as many clients as possible and it was weird for him because he know me as like we throw parties together we get drunk and we have fun and we do this and that and then I come back after college and he's like yo this dude like locked himself in his room and isn't talking to anybody and just trying to do whatever he's doing in there. He didn't even know. And then, and then um, I ended up going from about six, $700 in recurring monthly revenue to 5,000 within the first 30 days, just a straight locking in. So it's that's real. what I was doing. Man, that's, that's dope. That's just straight commitment. And the hustle is just different, right? So now, right, you guys, you guys grew this brand, right? You guys are, you guys have celebrities wearing it and all these awesome things are going for you guys what what's like the core mission of support black college like what what is like that thing that you still hold on to the, till this day even though now you guys are scaling you guys are growing and which we'll get into that in a little bit what's still the core thing the core thing really is just to inspire uplift and raise awareness for hbcus so even though we start to hit all these goals i write down you know my like lifetime goals every single day in the morning. So the number two goal that I write down is I expose 10 million people per month to HBCUs. So even though we hit these monthly revenue numbers or whatever, it's more so like, all right, how do I get it to where we're scaling to expose more people and uplift and inspire and raise awareness? Because I realize like when you set money goals, you tend to hit them and then they just tend to double and triple and quadruple. So it's very hard to like make yourself you know, you, you feel good about it, but it's not very fulfilling once you like really just get in money. Then it's like, OK, so now I need to switch my goals from they back in the day. They used to be how do I get to 5K a month and 10K a month and 20K to now? How do I support the community? How do I raise awareness? How do I expose 10 million people? So that's kind of where we you know our goals are now and our, our pretty much our mission just to expose and raise as much awareness awareness as possible. Mm. that's awesome that's that's really that's really awesome okay so you guys are now i see you you're networking with you guys work with a lot of people in atlanta you got like atlanta's like the new um black excellence hub right so hot like wall street <laughs> yeah. yeah so how, how, how did you guys like all meet you know how'd you meet all those people how'd you network with all those people because you guys are actually doing something dope because everybody there promotes everybody else right there's enough there's enough like money to go around for everybody it's not like oh why should i promote your stuff when i could just promote mine right like, right, right right yeah so it's interesting you know the way that i'm the youngest out of everyone in the group so everybody is like you know 35 40 45 i'm t i just turned 26 so i um the way that i found my way into the group was um the guy that runs our ads he hit me up and was like yo one of my other clients um he's about to pay some lady five fifteen thousand dollars for a consultation so like you know install some apps on this website and this and that and i was just like i mean tell him to hit me like and he called me and he was like yo i'm man i'm about to pay this lady to do this this and that and i was like where you at and he just told me and i was like all right i'll be there in like 10 15 minutes so i pull up and then i just sat down with them for like maybe like three four hours and just did everything for free like yo this is how you ship properly this is like the thermal printer printer you want to get this is all the apps that you need like literally just pretty much a free consultation that he was about to pay $15,000 for. And I mean, I didn't know them. Like I knew of all of these people. And this was for um, Jason and his wife, Mr. Two Weeks Out and Miss Two Weeks Out with the, the company Body Envy. So I went over there and I just, you know, just tried to help him out. And then after that, 
I mean, it was what it was. So then I noticed that they started to do these uh, every Friday masterminds where uh, Him 500 and Jason and Neo and all of them would be. So I was just messing with Jason. I was like, y'all boys, you know, y'all ain't got no real game getting delivered at the mastermind. Like, y'all need some young blood in there because we really got the sauce for it. Like, you know, we got our hands on the in the pot, like really trying to figure it out. And then he was like, man, come through to the next one or whatever. So then I go to the next one. It was at Top Golf, and then the first person I met was Neo, and then um, a bunch of other guys like Gooch, and you know, just all these people in these different spaces. And then um, we just started to uh, to you know network and fellowship. And the way that I got really close with Neo was because he was asking me. He was like, "Yo, how much did, how much did you make last month?" And I was like, six hundred fifty thousand. And then he was like, "Okay, you know, that's cool, but are you teaching anybody how to do it?" And I was like, "Nah, not really. I'm just like." building the business. And he was like, well, you know that you got 650,000 in revenue last month, but if you package that knowledge and then taught people, you can make 650,000 a month just from teaching people how to do it too. And I was like, I mean, I agree, but it just wasn't like, wasn't my thing, you know? And then he was like, look, bro, you got seven days to just write down everything that you know about e-commerce and then come back to me with that. And I'll teach you how to package it up and you can make some money off of it. And I was like, whatever. So I go back seven days, lock myself in my room again. I went nine to five from uh, nine to five support black colleges, then five, like six until like 2 a.m. Just writing down everything that I knew for, you know, like seven, 14 days straight. Came back to him and showed him. And he was like, oh, wow. Like, you know, whenever we usually meet guys, we'll tell them stuff like that, but they don't execute. So like, I respect that you're like a massive executor. And then I did that and he taught me how to do all of these, like, you know, click funnels and all of this other stuff. And then that's how we became close. It's just like being like very, one, providing value to just get in the circle. Mind you, I, I didn't care whether I got in or not. I just wanted to help out. And then two, to be a massive executor because at that level that you know all of us are on you just want to be around people that's going to take advice be coachable and execute and try to get themselves to the next level so when they saw that in me they started inviting me to everything and then i brought my business partner in and now we just all hang out almost every day mm -hmm. that's what's up man and what y'all doing is really legendary it's very needed for our <clears throat> communities super that, needed nah that's that's definitely dope so Speaking about like execution, right, and how important executing is, like when you guys when you guys do like a drop, right, it goes it goes crazy. So like, what's the what's the strategy behind like one of you guys' drops, right? Because this show a lot of people that do e commerce they listen to it and they they take some of the game from it. So like, let's say like um, example, I'm dropping like a new product, right, in my line, right. You got you guys crush it with your uh, with your launches, by the way, like. What's the first step? Like, what are some things I should like focus on during my launches to make sure like 100% is successful? Um, first thing that we do is we'll get samples of whatever the product is, and then we'll just kind of showcase it to our audience to see if they even like it. And a lot of the times you'll be able to tell whether something's going to do really well or not just based on showing it to the audience. But to even get to that level of where you have a concentrated audience that you can showcase things to and get an opinion, you have to provide a lot of value. Like most of our page isn't even selling at all, which is like giving information about our, you know, black colleges and black excellence and, you know, all of that different cool stuff in, in our demographic. So build, building that piece first is very important because that's how we're able to get some market research done because we're just putting samples out and saying like, yo, what do y'all think? And because they're already in our demographic, they have ideas and they have, you know, um, they, they just want to give their opinion based on what, the stuff that we're putting out that uh, pertains directly to them. So we put the sample out and then they say, oh, we like it. Cool. Next thing we do is with that sample that we have, we shoot promo videos and, you know, all of that product shots and just everything that you need to release the product. So we're not like buying crazy stock at all. Actually, like we never buy stock, to be completely honest. Whoa. So you never buy stock? <laughs> nah, like even the drop that we just did, I mean, we didn't have no stock. We just, you know, did the drop and then tell them like, yo, it's a pre-sale, like, the orders will ship out this and that day and we'll say you know it could be like two three four weeks out from the day that we drop and then that is that's enough time for us to just hit up our manufacturer and be like yo we just sold three thousand pairs of shorts get to making it and then when it comes in we just ship it all out so but to get there 
you do the samples, you show the samples, then you record advertising with the samples, then you put the more like more polished stuff out like okay y'all like this it's gonna drop on this and that day and then we do lifestyle shots so we'll sprinkle in a lifestyle shot here lifestyle shot there we'll do sms marketing we'll do email marketing saying yo this drop is coming on this day the next week hey, it's coming on this day and it's also important to like know that a lot of our stuff we we aren't even marketing to get sales at all so like we have a weekly email that's just like you know, catching up with support black colleges and every Sunday or Monday, I think it is, we'll be like, yo, this is what happened in the HBCU space this past week. And we'll kind of do a recap of everything that we posted on our social media. And then we'll say like, oh, this drop is coming on this day. So we're giving value on social media and also giving value in our email, not asking for a sale at all, like not even at all, like close to asking for any money. So that just kind of helps the audience be like, okay, these guys are trying to educate the market and educate the space. And then it also gets us a little bit of shareability because now people are willing to opt into our text list and our email list because they know that these guys just aren't selling all the time. So then, oh man, I got another strategy too. It's too crazy. Uh, Damn, okay, I got to <laughs> drop the gems. So, um, now we're at the point to where we're about to drop so all the whole time we're on social media dropping constantly like yo this is what's coming this is what's coming and then the day of we just you know send out a, a huge blast like emails um text messages social media and then since we've been able to do all of this stuff to nurture the audience and build a community the drops usually go pretty well so like even the drop that we did a few like a day or two ago we did a hundred thousand dollars in one day and we ran no ads at all so you know most mm -hmm. of that's all profit because you're not spending anything to acquire the customer mm -hmm. so the, that's pretty much this strategy works if you already nurtured your customers and you've been nurturing them for a while right yeah. what you guys do but like you you know with a, a lot of um e-commerce people they it's the one-time customer and then they they like leave so do you have a strategy for like the one-timers like when you pay for instance the paid ads right now ads ads are getting more expensive with the new ios update right. and everything like that yeah. so like let's say i'm just running ads like a first time type thing right i get this customer yeah. one time which is the normal thing for a lot of people that do e-commerce right they don't usually nurture the long way they 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 pay they want that customer to pay right away um yeah i mean so we do that too you know we'll, we run ads to cold audiences and we get people to purchase with us as well but i think that the thing that they need to realize too is that they need to do a little bit of community building as well because it's actually more important in my perspective to running ads because we know as advertisers there's always more people coming into the space and we're liable to whatever facebook wants to do and facebook and instagram so you know ios 14 comes out there's nothing we could really do about that so if we don't have other avenues like email like text when we own all of this data then it's very difficult for us and we know that this is coming we know that more advertisers are coming to the space so cost per purchase is going to keep going up so why are we not thinking let's start nurturing audiences and building organically rather than just focusing only on paid ads so that's the first mindset shift that even needs to happen but just to give a strategy too for the new person uh, i can do that as well so this is the strategy i was talking about it's going to take a little second but it's very powerful wow. so this is so good okay. <laughs> <Too much> <laughs> <laughs> uh, i love it so love this is a strategy we've been, this is a strategy we've been using lately so what we'll do is we will build a a page like um probably using like page fly or um, what else we use like a Clavio page or just anything like that. We'll build a page that'll have um, a video, like the video that we're talking about that we make with the samples. Right under that, then we'll have you know your opt-in or your countdown timer, and then the text. Then it will be like this drop is happening on X Y Z date. Opt in below to get early access to the release, like two to five minutes before the release will happen, and then we'll actually run ads to that landing page rather than to our store. So we run ads to the landing page as a custom conversion rather than a, you know, just a purchase or a purchase conversion. And you'll find that when you're getting people to opt into something for free, you're able to acquire that customer for a lot cheaper than actually trying to just get them to, pur to purchase. So we'll get them for, you know, a dollar, two dollars, maybe three if it's not doing that well. And then we'll, you know, just run ads straight to that. So 
Then after they complete the opt-in on the second page after, it'll say continue shopping. So then they'll click the button to continue shopping and now they'll go onto the website and actually make a purchase too. So we required the customer for one to $3 to get them to opt in, but then they're still spending money too. So we're actually getting a price per purchase as well because you know they're actually spending money too. So it doesn't come through as a price per purchase obviously because it's a custom conversion, but you'll find that those ads still make money because people are still going to shop. So now, the most important part about this is that it's list building. So we built the list and we're building, you know, hundred, few hundred people, a few thousand people. As you spend a little bit more money, obviously you have to have a very strict budget when you're doing it this way and a good product. So, you know, that, that's the only really hard part about it. So if you say, all right, I'm gonna spend $5,000 or $10,000 or a hundred dollars, whatever it is, I'm gonna acquire all of these customers. So then what you do is, as you acquire them, you start to send out different information to them. So you'll send out the pictures of the sample, you'll send out the video or you know whatever creative that you make through email and um, text message, because that's the information you're gathering, nurturing them in that way. Even though they're a first time buyer, you're still nurturing them as you go along the drop. Day before, you send out an email and a text saying the drop's tomorrow. Then the day of, you send out a text saying the drop is now, but you password protect your Shopify store. And then you say, you know, you're getting rewarded for being on our list and opting in. You got two to five minutes to go ahead and shop before we release it out to everybody else. So mm -hmm. then we we drop the items and then we only we, do, we send out the message with the password. They go in and shop. And because they know that drops usually are very scarce in general or that they are new customers and they have two to five minutes to start to shop then they are very like in a very scarcity type of mindset so instead of seeing like a one to two percent conversion which you'll usually see just like you know off the strength like that's industry standard you see like five ten fifteen twenty percent because these people are very scared and they want to shop before the two to five minutes is over so then after that you go ahead and release out to the floodgates of everybody else and then now you might have sold out in the first two to five minutes and that's good if you do because now everybody else you've trained them that our drops always sell out and you've trained them that you need to opt into our list so that you can get you know access to getting these drops and now everything starts to grow exponentially over time you gain you keep doing this type of um you know this method you gain more subscribers and your drops get exponentially better every time because you're training your customer each time so. damn 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 he just <laughs> that's a gem guys. That's like, even a we're gem. taking away a lot of notes from this because this is real hardcore, you know, like information that you share. And like this is this is is advanced. But, you know, I want everybody to take away this and like really, you know, execute on this. Appreciate you for sharing that. Justin. Yeah, Maybe. I don't know. I'm wild for that one. Cause, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too fire. No, nah, that's that's dope. That's dope, man. That's that's what this podcast is about. Straight bars. That's, that's what we do here. You know, OK, so you talked about bars, man, cool. that's what I'm saying. <laughs> All right, so you talked about creative, right? With now the new iOS update and everything, like literally for everyone that's in the e-commerce space, creative is literally everything at this point. Like if you don't have enough creative, you know, people are still trying to use their creative from like the last three months ago. That's not working anymore. You got to continuously like push out creative at all times, right? So like how important is it for you guys, especially at Support Black College, you guys have like, the logo's fire, by the way. It's like it's like something that you, it catches the eye so right away, right? So you guys do so much different creatives, and how important is it for someone to just continuously keep pushing out new creatives? Yeah, you know, once you get to a certain level, you start to realize that the only things that really matter is creative and copywriting, mm -hmm. because as you start to spend a lot of money, I mean, we've been at you know, spending 2,500 a day, 5,000 a day. There's times where we spend 10,000 a day and times where I tell our our team, like you can spend $100,000 a day for, you know, a certain amount of time period. And you realize that you start to run through these audiences pretty quickly. So you have to have creative to be able to keep showing these people something different. And, you know, I think that once you get to that level and you realize that it's like, OK, the only way for me to keep doing well in this space is to have more creative, 
or change the words that I'm saying to these people. So, or find new people to target. So that's really it, you know? So I think that it's very important to understand that, I mean, creative is arguably the number one thing that matters. Um, and I think that the top three things that matter are your creative, your ad copy, and then your targeting. And then beyond that, your website optimization. Cause I find that people just like, especially beginners, they really overlook that. And that's arguably the most important thing because if we don't do any of these four things correct, if we do one wrong, then we're destined to fail. You know, if I target the right person and I say the right words, but the creative is trash, there's no way I'm gonna make money. And if I have a great fire creative and I have a fire ad copy, but I target the wrong person, then it's, it's no way. So I think that that's probably the biggest piece, just to know that those four things in general are probably the most important thing in e-commerce, arguably. Exactly. Now, that's that's a great point you mentioned there. And so so you just dropped some gems in your space. Right. So what what uh, especially like working with like um, let, let's go back. Let's loop around like working with um HBCUs, right? How, how, how has that how has that been, right? Because it's much different than working with like the traditional like U of M, you know, U of U of A, all these other things. So like, are they are they like, um, do the schools actually like like work with you guys directly, or do you guys work with like the student boards? And how, how does that relationship work? We do a little bit of all of it, honestly. Like a lot of our strategy and community building is working directly with the kids that go there too. So like working with the kids in high school that are thinking about going to HBCUs, working with kids that are actually currently there and working with alumni. But we also work with the schools directly too. One of the campaigns we're doing right now is like going live with every single HBCU. So we just reach out to their administration and then we just go live with them and let them talk. They talk in front of like our audience, like, yo, this is like, what's up with our school. These are the programs we have to offer X, Y, and Z. But it's, it's not very difficult. You know, we just reach out to them. And then also we work with the schools by all of the stuff that has like actual school logos on it. You have to get it licensed. So we the portion of the money that we make from all of these schools goes straight back to the school through licensing, too. So, you know, there's a few different ways. Damn. Nice, nice. What, so, yeah, that's awesome, man. What are you looking forward to uh, with support black colleges? Like what's what's what's, what's next, next for, you? for you guys? You guys have been crushing it. Man, bro, probably just scaling up even further, um, scaling up, doing a little bit of wholesale. A bunch of big companies are reaching out to us, especially with like all of this stuff that's going on, with, like social injustice and things of that nature. You know, it's become quote unquote cool. It's always been cool to us, you yeah, know, like now it's, but it, it's becoming cool now to like be inclusive and also to, you know, just represent our people. So we just, you know scaling up that way getting into all of these uh, different businesses like wholesaling and then um i'm trying to think what else like now just teaching people how to do what we did and that's kind of where we at with things right now awesome what's one takeaway that you want people to know that are listening in uh as an early stage entrepreneur like what's one thing that you want to let uh, share with man i'm trying to think like Biggest takeaway for me, first thing that's coming to my head is early, early in my like entrepreneurial journey, I realized that like I was different from a lot of different people. And I feel like there might be someone out there that's like just now getting started and they just they don't know or like whatever. But I want somebody to hear and it's like maybe they are feeling what I felt. And it was I walked into a room and it was four people on the floor asleep in my apartment. And I looked down and I was like, bro, I'm destined for more than this. Like, um, there's there's a greatness inside of me. And something told me, like, it was weird, bro. Like, my heart started burning. I don't know if I ate, like, a bad taco or something or, like, what was going on. But my heart was burning. It was like, bro, you, you're meant for more than this. So if you do have that feeling, then, you man, you got to go with it, bro, because environment is everything. You know, I looked down and I saw people that didn't have the same vision as me. And I had to realize that. Everybody wants money, but money follows value and value follows vision. So I had to have a big enough vision for myself to say, I don't belong here and I need to move around. So I think that there might be someone listening to this, like needing to change their environment, needing to grow their vision or needing to just trust what's being told to them or they're telling themselves. And that was the biggest bet that I had to make was first just 
trusting that I was meant for more and turned out that I was right. So I think that if anybody's listening to this, especially for the new entrepreneur, if you have that feeling or you're seeing your environment and it's not fruitful for you, then you got to move around, bro, no matter who it is family, friends. I'm talking about straight family that was living with me. So, but I had to, you know, move around and then now I was able to reach back and pull them up with me. So that it might be difficult in the beginning, but it's much better to follow your vision, follow your journey, your destiny, and then reach back and pull those people up, then blame them for you not being able to be where you are and then building resentment against them because we, I want to love my families, but I had to go out and do my own thing, get myself right first before I could pull, reach back and pull them up too. So first thing came to my head, bro. Damn. Facts, man. That's powerful. Chasing that burning desire within. That is awesome. That's, that, that's, that's super important. And like right now you guys are crushing and you guys are doing big things. Like what do you think is still holding that burning desire, right? Because you still want to get to the next level, right? As entrepreneurs, when you, when you taste a little success, right, it's easy to get, like, comfortable. It's easy to say, okay, like, all right, I'm at this new level now. I'm going to just chill now, right? Yeah. So, like, what, what, what keeps y'all pushing to keep, like, pushing the envelope? We got to get to – we got to keep scaling. You know, the first thing that came to your mind was when I asked you that question, you were like, oh, we got to keep scaling, man. We got to get to the next yeah. level, you know? Some people would have been like, all right, we just got to float here, man. We got we to gotta just maintain. <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> um i think it's about a lot about like who i surround myself with um and then also you know scaling is cool and nowadays it feels more so like a video game it's like all right like can we do a million in a day now like you know so that's always fun to just kind of test the limits but i mean even beyond that Scaling is good, but like I said earlier, you know, when you set those types of money goals, they tend to double, triple, quadruple, but I understand that now. So now it's more so about just becoming a better person every day and, you know, just setting my goals higher every day. And if I found that if I keep trying to be a better person every day, then that's something that I can never really just get to, you know, like I can always aspire to be a better person, but no matter what, if I get 1%, 2%, however much percent better every single day, I'll be trying to do that until the day that I die. It's something that's not going to be fulfilling. Well, like it can't be all the way fulfilled, but it can fulfill me and, you know, keep me whole as I'm moving forward because I know that I'm trying to be a better person every day. And with that comes, challenging myself and trying to beat different goals and although that kind of comes with scaling and then also realizing bro like you know at one point I was a kid sleeping on the floor you know so like you keep that type of mentality you always know that you got to keep going or the floor might meet you back where you are you know what I'm saying like if you don't if you stop you know then you may just be back in that situation that you didn't want to be in. And that's not a place that I ever want to be back in again. So I, I constantly am motivated and pulled forward by the positive and the things and the goals and the money and, you know, friendship and fellowship and all of that stuff. But then I'm also reminded every day, like, Hey bro, two years ago, you was on the floor. You was like doing negative stuff. You was, you know, not really like fulfilling yourself. Like, Hey, if you don't, if you, if you get comfortable, you don't keep going, then that's somewhere where you can't be again. So just kind of staying humble, bro. Like you got to, because the minute you take your eyes off of trying to get bigger and better, then that's right where you fall. And you know, when you think that you know everything and you're the smartest person in the room, that's when you fall. So remembering that, I think that's why. You know. Damn, that's that's fire, man. You spit some facts on this show today, man. Uh, yeah, yeah, man. We definitely appreciate you for coming on and sharing all the value, man. Let the people know like where where they can find you, um, where they can find your brand, how they how they could support the brand, every, everything. Let them all know. Yeah, sure. So our brand on Instagram is Support Black College. Um, our website is Support Black Colleges with the S dot org. My personal Instagram is I Hope Nation. My business partner's Instagram is Mr. Arvinger. I'm sure y'all have like some type of whatever, but yeah that's where we at perfect awesome. and and uh make sure y'all follow the one uh support black college with the blue check mark because i see a lot of people they've been trying to <laughs> duplicate y'all right so yeah, facts appreciate you coming on the show man really appreciate that and spitting so much gems like a lot of takeaways that the people can really know and you know like uh impact like just 
you know, put into into, into their uh, brands and stores. So awesome, yep. man. Appreciate you guys for. Yeah, appreciate you guys for listening to another Top Figure episode. You know, on this show, we give you guys all the keys so you can open endless doors. And we are out. Mm-hmm.